Welcome to another episode of the Collab Talk podcast, where we discuss the convergence of technology, business productivity, and collaboration culture. My guest today is Adam Harmitz. Hello, Adam. Great to be here. VP of product at Microsoft, and we're talking today. So here's my fancy title, Collaborative by Design, colon, Cultivating a Culture of Collaboration. Love it. Alliteration. Yeah, have to do that. So for folks that don't know, Adam, maybe more of an introduction, what you focus on there at Microsoft. Yeah, sure. Uh, today, um, I run a product data science and customer um, experience team that uh, focuses on a couple different areas of of, um, of Microsoft 365. So in particular, SharePoint, bread and butter, grew up through the SharePoint team, as, as many of us did um, in the SharePoint community. Uh, but it branches out into Viva, uh, various elements of Viva. I was a founding member of Viva and on the Viva leadership team right now because, you know, SharePoint and Viva overlap quite a bit in terms of helping employee experiences um, and helping organizations thrive. Um, and then I sit on Jeff Teeper's larger leadership team, which thinks about all the collaborative apps and platforms at Microsoft. And, um, you know, and it's a, yeah, good good old charter. It's, and there's a lot under the hood. I mean, look, there's a, uh, it's not surprising why you look at the leadership team and see people that have been there. Like you're closing in on 20 years as well. Is it next year when you hit the 20? I think so. Yeah. This would be 19. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's funny. We started talking about doing this episode um, about a year and a half ago. Cause you were, I think I reached out to you first when you had just started your sabbatical. So you yep. took that time off and then we saw each other, um, interviewed at, um, at ESPC. Where was that ESPC? Which one was that? Um, two oh, they all were together. I, I know. know. I know this, that we talked maybe, again in maybe Prague, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Prague, you know, well, I'm sure we saw each other at Prague, but we, uh, we connected again, uh, in Amsterdam this, this yep. last December. Um, but it was also when we first talked was relatively close to the launch of work lab of that mm -hmm. site. And remember when we talked about, cause you were, you were focusing on some other things, again, not tool-based, you were doing kind of bigger thinking about, you know, culture and experiences when I talked to you um, about this. And I, I, I love, you know, that, that fit in very well with the cultural aspect of what I love talking about. And what years ago, I can't remember if I told you this, I was actually going to go do a doctoral program where funny enough, this is 25 years ago. Yeah. Uh, and my planned study was to look at the, uh, at how collaboration technology impacted working teams, how yeah. it changed culture. And which is really like exactly what work lab looks at studies. A lot of the research there, it's the home of the, if you're not familiar with the work lab website, it's the uh, uh, it gives a behind the scenes of like the thinking of how Microsoft builds technology. And it's also the home of like the work, tr uh, work trend index report and analysis. And so, yeah, I, I, I don't know, have you written for, for work lab or do you blog separately about those kinds of topics? Yeah. I mean, well, the work lab stuff is done by, um, you know, user research experts, mostly those who do deep, deep analysis and research that has quite a bit of rigor and backing to it. Um, and I think the origin story of that for sure was um, as Microsoft deepened our relationship with customers to focus more on just sort of IT tools as we did things like Viva, which is absolutely a, you know, technology is not going to solve all your employee experience. It has one role to solve. And so does your people and your processes and your leadership strategy. And obviously with AI, which is a huge transformation, you see the same thing, right? There's a role for AI and there's a role for change management and learning what others are doing. And so Work Lab and Work Trends Index was really saying like, hey, you know, customers wanted our relationship to be more than just how to deploy the tool. It would be how to holistically think about this problem. Also what the data that we are seeing on a global footprint from usage patterns are saying and what, you know, what analysis can we take from that? And just in general, like, 
customers are relying on Microsoft more and more for guidance on how to approach some of these big transformational problems um, in their lives, in their organizational lives. Um, in addition to technology, what advice can you give on how I can be a better executive, a better person who's wrestling with these programs, a better change agent? Um, and so that was really the origin story of that. I, I, you know, I do a lot of sort of separate personal blogging on my own journey as a product maker with my wife, actually, who's also a VP of product at a, at a growth stage startup. Um, so I have a lot of thoughts on, and I've seen over the years, just like, oh my gosh, like what used to be limited by technology is now limited by the ability for humans to all get on the same page. <laughs> and that is the limiting factor of how much we can achieve together. And I think that's super fascinating. And it, um, as, as a product versus, you know, core software development, like products at the very center of that, um, that bottleneck and solving that bottleneck. So. Well, that, that's a, it, it's funny. And like, so what we, the, the interim, while we talked about getting together, doing this episode, um, we had a little, uh, a release of something called copilot that happened and, uh, uh, uh people probably are, aren't aware of what that is. Um, <laughs> Microsoft needs to do a better job of, 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 I think selling people on that. No, uh, well, I, I yeah. just, how did you choose a title for this talk with a bunch of C's in it and not that, <laughs> that word. So I don't, I don't understand. Well, the, the podcast is the collab talk podcast. <laughs> if I focus on collaboration, no, but I, but if you talk about like that gap between the people and the technology, the, the people with each other, and that's actually a huge opportunity uh, for organizations is, is for AI to help decipher the two. I mean, you think of it almost like when I was back in the working in the manufacturing collaboration technology for the manufacturing space, a lot of what we were doing is that you'd have different ERP platforms trying to communicate to, get, to each other. And there was an opportunity for these third parties to create like a box, a device that could take the incoming messages from two disparate systems, sort it out, and then communicate back. And AI has the ability to fill some of that gap. Oh, no, absolutely. Um, um, a thousand percent. And, you know, this has happened in our industry many, many times. Every X number of years, there's a new interaction model, everything from mainframes to PCs, more things be connected from PCs to the cloud. Well, you can now have more SaaS solutions. We're all about interconnecting disconnected services and AI is just a, the next evolution of that, that frontier. Absolutely. And, um, you know, it's exciting because I do think it is, uh, there's always market and customer demand for more interop between disparate systems and every evolution of technology, you know, makes a leap on that. And then eventually you can see you can't eke out any more <laughs> integration yeah. among that leap. And so you invent another one and you know whether, you know, it, not to rag on crypto because that's probably going to get a bunch of haters on the podcast, but like, you know, you know whether a, a, a emerging technology is going to like actually be sustainable, whether it can actually move forward on that, on diff several different axes, but one of them certainly in our productivity and collab space is the ability to bring interconnected systems together. And you could say, other technologies, like you look at it, you're like, nah, I just don't believe that's going to be the paradigm shift step function. And you are, look at AI and like, is boy. that a back, is that a backdoor slam against Dogecoin? I mean, uh, come on. No comment, no <laughs> comment. But um, more to the point for AI, like it is so clear that, that it is going to have a, a, among many other positive outcomes and risks we have to manage, but um, positive outcomes, it is being able to bring interconnected, disconnected systems and people um, together. You know, one of the things I'm blessed that I get to is as part of the uh, ESPC community reporters the last few years, I, every year I, I get to interview Jeff Teeper hmm. as part of when he's out there keynoting. So it's like you see for folks that uh, follow along, like there's the official ESPC interviews, you'll see Teeper up there talking. I'm the one standing behind the camera asking the questions, putting that together, and then I get edited out my voice, everything on there. But it's but it's me that's there. But um, one of the things uh, we talked about a little bit during that interview um, was with uh, with the the change that we just we don't yet understand with around AI and Copilot specifically. Um, he made the comment talking about in parallel like cloud technology, and he says like it, it was. He says it took you know, since I started talking selling cloud solutions was back in two thousand one. That's when I got aware of the, the, the topic and was going and talking with 
customer prospects, trying to convince them, yes, move your data into this SaaS solution in the cloud and strong pushback from that. And Tipper mentioned, he says it wasn't until like 2016, 2017, where he felt like it really just clicked and everybody accepted like, this is the future. This is where it's going to be. So that's, you know, 15, 16 years. It took time to get people to really accept the cloud. Uh, Copilot AI is moving so much more quickly. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, that that's, and, and I'd say that, well, let me ask you this. Do you think Microsoft has it figured out what that looks like in the next even three to five years, what that team culture and experience will look like? I mean, uh, <laughs> Benedict Evans has this quote, uh, he's a tech analyst, uh, you know, anybody who thinks they know the future of AI is a fool, perhaps a clever fool, because people offering certainty will attract people to them because in this uncertain time. Um, and hey, I mean, I think Microsoft runs on trust. I think, uh, like, seriously, that's just not something we say. I think maintaining and accelerating customer trust is incredibly important. And so I think that's a mix of saying, here's what we're sure about, and here's what we're going to learn together. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I do hope that we have a lot of signals that gives us um, a point of view on the world and a point of view on how to adopt AI responsibly and well, um, and things we're very sure about and things we're hopeful of and investigating. And, and I think we're pretty clear, um, especially at our major conferences, you know, builds upcoming about yep. what we're sure about and what we're moving forward on. And, and I think customers are want to bet and partner with us um, and trust and build trust with us on both what's ready and what's speculative. And, you know, there's a whole spectrum of customers that want to adopt very early that want to sort of only adopt AI that seems pretty mainstream and, you know, and in a whole spectrum there. And so, you know, I, I think we have a great view compared to others in the industry, and we're sharing that view and using it to build a lot of trust and make sure AI is deployed responsibly. But no, do we have every single thing figured out? Do we think we know, like, in three years um, exactly where we want to be? No, that's it's, a, uh, I would say, two things. We always do our best work at Microsoft when we're co-developing with our customers, both on, in a big and a small way, and this is no... Um, uh, this is no exception. We wouldn't have even been where we are today without incredibly awesome feedback in a you know very tight fashion with some of our early adopters, and we continue to learn from that. Um, but I do hope that when we're doing our best work at Microsoft, we are a, a, a partner that customers can trust to be farther ahead of than anyone else they could choose. Um, partly because of our global scale, partly because we're really good, hopefully as, as product makers, and partly because we're really building that trust with with our part with our community, our partners, our customers, and and bringing forward along. And you mentioned work trends already. Like that is, I think, one of the ways we build that trust is to be very public about what we're learning and very um and you know share that with the world. Um, you know, I'd have no way of proving this, but I think the Copilot roll rollout might be the most studied piece of software hmm. rollout in the history of the world. Well, <laughs> like, well, what else would have been more studied than this? I get it. I guarantee you, the very early on, partly learning from the cloud and how it was deployed yeah. and what we could have done to help prepare people more for that. You know, I had friends who were who who were really whose careers were impacted, many positively, but many not so positively about the cloud rollout. Um, yeah you know, as they were great at racking and stacking servers, but couldn't make the leap to what modern IT is was needed from in the cloud. And I feel really um, responsible. I feel responsible for that. And I feel in, in the era of AI, to knowing that such disruptions are also going to happen. Um, that's one of the reasons we share and partner. And Well, that's uh, what, and, what's and interesting. Like, yeah. what, what are the comments that I make about talking with a lot of clients around digital transformation, I think one of the gaps in talking about that is that a lot of organizations think of digital transformation, they think instantly of, well, yeah, upgrading to the newest version of whatever. It's like, no, it's like you go back to what you said. It's there's the tools, the technology, certainly. There's people, there's process, all of those things are part of it. Um, for me, digital transformation isn't so much around upgrading to less technology, latest technology, because you can use uh, older technology, older programs and get high productivity. It has more to do with like, are we optimized to the tools, our processes, and our people? Are we being, are we the best that we can be? Are we doing more? Are we generating more? Are we innovating more? Are we collaborating more? 
um, all that kind of thing. I, one of the things I always use as an example, um, like, cause Microsoft, I'll say that when I left Microsoft in 2009, still so much of Microsoft sales was focused on selling the license, getting that in there. And, and there was my perspective, there was less interest, whether they actually used it or not, who cares? But what happened and specifically with office 365 is that people were getting to the end of their EAs and saying, we're getting like 30% adoption, 40% at best. Why are we paying for all this stuff? And somebody woke up, again, this is my outside perspective. Somebody woke up uh, and said, engagement adoption, what is that? And this is important. It's not just about selling licenses, but making sure people are using this technology. And so that's, that was the beginning. And this was, I, I, I mean, I would put it kind of in the 2011, 2012, when there seemed to be this wake up that, that happened where people started talking more about adoption. It helped that everybody's moving towards the cloud um, because, and I used to always say that, like, you've got all these people that know the servers, they know these boxes and so much of their time was spent keeping servers up and running rather than focusing on what are we actually running these servers and this software for the technology, this is to help our business. Our focus should be on the business doing more, not, Hey, I flipped switches and kept servers on and, and, and going, uh, and, and so going back to digital transformation, it's not just about updating all of these, these tools. It's like, what are we doing with that? I would argue that I think there's still a lot of work to be done on what digital transformation means. And now with the rise of AI, it makes it even more imperative that organizations don't just look at it as, hey, we deployed new technology, but how does this really fit in and change the way that we do business? And that's something where that's why I've like, I, I wasn't seriously asking like, what do you know in three to five years around that? They're saying that we, we have to communicate more. We have to be talking about this, sharing what we're learning. And this is why I'm so you know interested. I like, I have to be at Ignite. I have to be at ESPC because each one of these major and build is another thing I'll be watching online, but starting to get the stories come in of the pilots of the early deployments to really understand, like, what did you learn from it? Yeah, no. I, and I think we take that responsibility incredibly seriously. And to your mid 2010 shift, it was all about having the data that we didn't have before the currency for product success became monthly active users, not seats sold. Um, not that anybody didn't want to track engagement and usage before, but that's very difficult to do on prem. It was just a different business model. We right. just didn't, frankly, have responsibility for that half of the problem. It was all, you know, uh, different different stakeholders in the value chain. That uh, by the time I got to end users, and one of the things of the cloud, in addition to just cost reductions, it was just awesome. You know, great to save our customers money. Was also just this owning more of the end to end experience, and then having the ability to measure and take accountability for it. I mean, I mean, to your point, the, um, you know, I'm, I find myself to be the co-lead of the Microsoft 365 conference coming up. I don't actually know when this is published, if it's before or after, but it's April 30th. Oh, it's before. Yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, awesome. Everybody should come. But, yeah. uh, uh, and it's very fascinating to be a, a, a co-lead of a conference at the product maker. Generally, our marketing team uh, exclusively handles it. But, you know, these product level conferences are a lot more about guidance. Uh, and it's great to sort of be more involved in the the craft of putting on a conference. I'm now a snob for keynote stages, and I know every you know <laughs> how much money you can spend and what it looks like when you see yeah. better stages. Yeah. But in any case, like Dan Holm, a good friend of both of ours, mm -hmm. uh, I asked him to step up and and lead a, a super track at this conference for business decision makers. So like you know, it's like 65% IT, 10% developers, and the best of the folks are like, you know, everybody that IT partners with, or like people that are in the business using this, um, using all of that we, that we make. Um, and it was really interesting to see us all think about, so what are we going to do for these folks? And, you know, partly it was very Viva focused, because a lot of these business decision makers use Viva. And then partly we were sort of like, well, AI is coming. 
uh, and how do we prepare them for that? And then many of these folks are adoption specialists and change agents. And we sort of realized like, oh my gosh, that those three things are exactly the same thing. <laughs> like how can you use an employee experience platform to help with change? What is the biggest change you have to deal with? It's, uh, it's AI. And so, you know, there's the transform track or transformation track at this conference. And it just encapsulates exactly what you were saying, where it's sort of like, yes, technology has a role to play, especially the employee experience technology. Um, and, you know, but those, it's really a, a adoption, change management, you know, that's always, you know, for always core to the ethos of our community. And then really relating to that to AI, because AI is very, um, obviously it should be, you know, there's reason for people to have a little bit of fear of what's coming with it, but it is actually just, you know, a change management project, maybe more similar to ones you've already tackled in your career or at your organization. Um, but you didn't realize, you know, cause it's brand new. So you don't, you can't quite pattern match it to the types of change management rollouts you've done before, but all the technology and playbooks that you've used can help with, with the AI transformation too. Well, it's one of the reasons I'm a huge advocate for the adoption, uh, you know, a, a website as well. Yeah. Great resources that are out there. That's another thing. I mean, I, I, Microsoft has gotten uh, uh, much better at the documentation. I, I often talk about, and, and you know this too, having been in the SharePoint uh, world, that a lot of the SharePoint community, I would argue, uh, it was so cohesive and so strong because the documentation from Microsoft was so <laughs> inadequate for the needs of the other. And that's how we bonded, by sharing that, that information. And so and while that never slowed down and you have the MVP community, you have experts around the world that are providing a lot. In fact, if you go to dot docs.microsoft, a lot of the documentation is community uh, oriented. Of course, there's a lot of Microsoft people writing a lot of content, mm -hmm. but you'd be surprised going in and looking at reference material that's Microsoft's official documentation and guidance on products, how much is community authors that are that are on there um, and working yeah. closely with Microsoft around that. But yeah, again, this is something where I, I still, it just, it feels different. It was, so for years as a SharePoint, at going to SharePoint Saturdays, SharePoint conferences, all of those things, I'd say the majority of the content, 60% was IT pro related. Again, we're looking at the servers. We're looking at the administration yeah. of, of the tools. And then there was developers a second. The smallest, thinnest was the end user, the product, productivity yeah. was like yeah. how to actually use that. And it's now completely flipped around. So much is more business centric, how you use this, how do you get more out of it? How do you transform change your, your business around that? And which I think is fantastic. You know, one that we have the luxury that technology works well enough and the cloud has benefited us by, by, I don't have to manage servers. I've been a SharePoint admin, you know, and, and running that and doing that and permissions management and constantly. And now there are tools and partners and things that are out there. So you instead can focus on how can we run more efficient meetings? So I, I want to shift to that slightly. How has the meeting experience changed over the last couple of years inside of Microsoft? It, yeah, it, it's um, hard not to answer that question without recognizing the pandemic, of course, um, where, you know, <laughs> my org was a famous hashtag no screens culture in meetings where, you know, it sounds anachronistic at this point, but like too many people on their phones or laptops during a meeting sort of being grazers of meetings or, you know, virtual popcorn eaters instead of, instead of participating in the meeting. And we had a, a real culture of no, like be present, put your phone away. And then of course the um, pandemic started and all meetings were remote. And, um, and of course you had a screen and, you know, it was a little bit more about how to survive than it was how to how to thrive. Um, and um, and now it's, you know, we don't have a return to work policy. About 40% of my team is is not in the Puget Sound area, well over 50, if you include sort of dotted line folks that technically aren't in the reporting structure, but absolutely work on the on the mission and in the tribe. Um, and uh, and so, you know, you, you, you plan for that. You plan for almost everything being hybrid. Actually, this week right now, the entire team is in Redmond. We sort of do twice a year sort of on sites that sort of fill up our cup, both community and, and what, why, how, um, you know, uh, alignment. And um, and so, you know, I and, and Microsoft's 
commitment to growth mindset, to having many voices heard um, for a, a million good reasons, including it creates better software is also sort of um, incredibly important to how we run meetings in terms of raise hand and sort of that protocol. It's really shifted since it was, you know, mostly, um, uh, you know, in person only with a couple of people maybe trying to watch over over teams and, you know, before the pandemic. Um, and then, of course, you know, I can't help but mention Copilot. Uh, mm -hmm. Truly, that's one of the elements of Copilot that has the most product market fit, the most depth, the most positive reception from customers and my own usage. Like, it really is, um, you know, an ability if you miss something to be able to get um, updated on it. Uh, if you're not quite sure if you have alignment, you can literally ask your, you know, Copilot meetings Copilot for their assessment of, of how much alignment you have. I was just doing that with something with three VPs the other day and I was like, do we have agreement? And it like listed out each, each, each VP and, you know, agreement, but they had this concern agreement, you know, it was, it was, it was one of those um, magic moments for sure. Um, and so, you know, I think that's, you know, coupled it up, you know, transcripts is also, we just, I just had someone on my, my, uh, that I work with closely that had an ear infection and couldn't really couldn't hear well for a week um, and was able to use transcription, you know, obviously it's awesome for those with sort of more permanent disabilities as well, or for whatever reason, you know, also for, AI and transcription, you know, search and all that. But it's also just a great reminder that accessibility is, um, you know, also for, you know, it just makes software more usable and, and can help folks um, in a variety of different ways, including sort of, you know, even temporary types of stuff, which is sort of, I think, humanizes even more the the investment and in sort of accessibility features that I've seen a lot in from the meetings team over the years. Yeah, it. I, I often go back, I think it was, I th I think it was at the uh, old, the, before it got rebranded as Inspire, the partner conference, mm -hmm. where they did on stage, uh, you know, maybe it was Build, but they did like the future of meetings and they had like the little conference room set up on stage and they were kind of showing this and people were like, ah, look, this is all, I mean, they put, put it together, it's a, it's a demo, but it they, they emphasize there's the things that it does, the, the, the tools, the technology that was changing process before you go in the meeting, like, here's the things, here's the decisions you were supposed to make. This is what you were asked to do out of the last status meeting. You get all that for prep. Then there's in the meeting and they were showcasing some of the unified comms tools to be able to recognize the voices that were dialing in. There's somebody who's voice only. There were multiple people on screen. There are people sitting around the table and it was able to, through the crosstalk, capture that identify who those those were keep up with the the multiple threads of conversations happening and then after the meeting like summarizing that and it was you know that at the time they were talking about i think it was officially referred to as the cortana stuff i can't remember that branding happened later now now gone which i kind of like because i'm a halo guy but now you know there, there needs to be a, a cortana add-on or something or other to uh to co-pilot but anyway um but yeah. you have all the post meeting the analysis like here's what you need to do here's what you missed here were the side conversations here's the the the, the to do's off of that integration then into project into planner into you know your task your to do's i mean all that kind of stuff like i loved that vision of the future and but it just seemed so far away and out there but this was well before pandemic for them to be talking about a lot of this stuff. And I think really indicates too um, how long Microsoft has really been looking at AI and a lot of what, you know, the rest of the world kind of caught up to and were surprised by Microsoft being so much out in front. Um, you know, I, let me, let me ask kind of a broader question about your, uh, you know, cause you've been with Microsoft for a long time. Like how much have you seen around this own technology? I mean, how different would you say, or what are what are key differences that you see the way that your teams work together, that your business unit works together versus, you know, 10, 15 years ago? Yeah, I mean, there's just, gosh, uh, you're striking so many thoughts in me. Um, one is, uh, I do think we work in an industry, productivity and collaboration, where, you know, two things happen. One you don't realize until you look under like a year two or three and this is not just market it was globally in the industry and like how much more efficient and productive you've gone 
from the just the multitude of small fixes, you know, even, you know, not sending attachments around, actually having real co-auth, being able to Teams chat at a high volume per day. Understanding like, asynchronous collaboration, I think, is a huge change. But, but, but yeah, it, but, but there's two things in this industry. Some are, 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 um, are gradual and then sudden, like you're sort of talking about a little bit with the sort of meeting recap working mm -hmm. just like really well um many years of work but once it got in the customer's hands it was a step function change and i think those are great and we all lionize those because we see a lot of them and they're easy to sort of have heroes they demo around. well yeah yeah and and yeah. but but i actually like what gives the grit to make the one percent improvement every day makes a huge difference like you and i 10 years ago were sharing attachments around with no ability to co-op probably sending mostly email with no no real real maybe a couple chats a day um but like we're we are all way and, and that makes a difference in the amount that i can get done like and i look at my own career and my like literally i couldn't do the job i could do today if it wasn't for those productivity improvements i just couldn't scale i'm reading napoleon's biography uh right now and uh he wrote about three thousand um uh directives a year which is actually what that's almost 100 a day. So he spent a lot of time just sitting around telling people what to do, which maybe is a little bit wow. more like us. We yeah. see, but, he, yeah. it, but like, uh, and he was probably the number one, per, you know, the only person in the world sort of with that much sort of, and now every single person uh, who uses you know, uh, any of our collaboration technology, regardless of vendor can, can you know, be able to direct more than that, that type of interaction in a day. And if you think about the number of Teams chats and emails they're responding to and the, you know, right? And so maybe that's a too long story arc because we're talking 200 years, but even in just my career of 19 years, I, I, it's like, it, it, partly I've gotten better, I hope, at ma managing and processing information. And partly there's been step function changes like we just talked about. And then the unsung hero really is the grind from a bunch of product makers to eke out a little bit of progress until you don't even realize it, but you are way more efficient. You have way more superpowers than you ever realize in your ability to collab and be productive. And it's a, it, I love naming it for people who work on the team because the times get tough and you don't get as much credit for eking out the couple percent improvement bug fix on performance, but it makes a huge difference because it actually changes, frankly, probably more lives than some of these step function stuff, just in terms of um you know just the the way it enables collaboration to move forward and sets a new bar every every quarter every semester every year well that's a you know coming from a project management in a uh, you know a kind of a pmo background shared services teams that side of it why it's so important to baseline your metrics to be able to go back 30 every 90 sure. days you know quarterly to be able to show that that incremental improvement and look this has made a huge impact people need to hear that i mean that that's it's something else that i thought of as you were, were talking about this is that yeah i remember when we were talking about uh everybody getting like uh like ipads started and and smartphones and 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 people saying well and you know when you travel you're not going to need to have all these devices no what actually happened is we all had all these multiple devices I mean, I was for for years working in IT and and working with clients. Like, I had two phones. I had the personal and I had my company phone. I had a pager sometimes. In fact, as a joke, one time working in a client site back in two thousand five, um, I had the pager, my two phones, uh, my badge that was on like a belt clip on one of those expando lines, whatever. As a joke, I put a mini hung from my belt, a little lightsaber. Just to see if people, and I went almost the entire day without anybody realizing that I was standing in the doorway in a standing only like meeting and the director is just like, he like pauses talking and he looks at me and he's like, is that a lightsaber? <laughs> I was like, I, well, I'm wearing the utility belt. I mean, come on. Um, I, but, I uh, promise not to have any ounce of judgment in my voice. <laughs> one of the people who had the cell phone on the belt, uh, no, no judgment whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, no, it was very much over. I mean, people harass all the time. Like, look, I, like I, I, I'm on the go. You, you have devices, like just, just let it go. It's for work purposes. I wasn't doing it for style points, <laughs> but, um, but my point is that we, the new technology is so much more advanced. I mean, my, my mobile device today has so much more computing powers in the first 15 years of computers that I owned at, at home. Um, with all of that, you'd think, okay, we could use fewer devices. We didn't. 
we used multiple we use multiple devices uh, yeah but it's a, to take the human approach to it it opened up the the whole, obviously the mobile revolution among others sort of opened up a whole bunch of new joyous ways of experiencing computing oh, like oh, one of course my, you know, i just said how i got more productive over 19 years it's true but you know what i love to do every monday i go to a coffee shop and i manage my task list and i respond to some teams chats and i respond to some emails um and i can do it right from my phone this yep. is like th this is pedestrian christian like what we're talking about but well, like no but but here years ago i couldn't have done that i wouldn't right. have that joy of being able to work that way you had to go open the browser flexibility and i would have had to do it from home in front of a soulless like you know large desktop machine you know whatever it is so like um once again it's the grind of a thousand people eking out the progress until it was just like you, you know an experience that is taken for granted and that you know the best technology should be taken for granted because it's just there as opposed to being lionized as something that's um uh so novel that it is probably not good enough to be um taken for granted yet well here's where i was going with that why is because here we were you know, afforded this opportunity to it's we're as you said you know we're i'm you know so much more efficient than i was that with the tools of the setup it's why sometimes even now like when I'm out on the road, I'm traveling to conference and I'm frustrated because I'm used to having the two giant monitors, the setup where I could get everything done that I need to be done. And I'm out on the road, you know, and I'm like limited to this one smaller laptop screen. I've got my second screen plug in that I leave in my room to, to do that. Um, but part of this is that the more efficient we get, you would think that people would then... Uh, slow down a bit use that as an opportunity to be more reflective of the things so we're even more efficient and yet we're still going at that that high speed i mean i i, yeah. I don't know what the where i'm going with more of that like the do you set see that and recognize that is that something uh because something we did see during pandemic is that people felt like they had to be online all the time you know they're working even longer hours the great efficiency with a lot of these, the cool technology that came out of it and then burnout across the board. And so yeah. is that something that you think about as you're developing these solutions and thinking about, hey, great, increased productivity, but how are we actually impacting our people? Yeah, no, I mean, well, I think it's, uh, we could talk about that my personal journey, my team's journey, and then my journey as a as a product maker of either contributing or helping with the problem for sure. Um, so we can take the conversation in any direction. But yeah, for you know, one of the reasons I shared the like, yeah, I'm getting more efficient in my job, but I also love going to the coffee shop in the morning. Like yeah. when technology is at its best, it can do both things, right? Like and and um and I think that that's cool. Um, you know, there's no doubt uh making people more efficient and better at their jobs is great. Like, you know, I uh, forget the economist who said there's not too many universal elixirs in this world, but productivity improvements, one of them, right? Like, um, I, I guess you're, we should measure happiness, but just in terms of like, in, in what most, ec most economics are about trade-offs, right? A or B, but productivity improvement actually gives you A and B to, you know, um, and we could all talk about how to distribute the benefits of that and make sure it's done fairly and the roles of, of various organizations in doing that. But anyways, to make it less theoretical, um, yeah, I mean, I, personally, I, I love I, a lot of my blogging has been about sort of the burnout and boredom spectrum spectrum. It's one of my top sort of top posts that I've written, something that I think deeply about you and I sort of the impetus for this was during my sabbatical, which is absolutely sort of a recharge time. I think most creative people would say their moments of inspiration come from when they're not in the arena uh, day to day. You need that. You need that fodder. You don't want to be someone out of the arena, but you need to step back in order to see. Um, and I feel that myself. I have an ener I have a job where my energy is the limiting factor, not my time. Um, mm -hmm. And my bill, you know, and restoring my energy is important. And I do every time I take a step back and come back, I come back with some new idea, new way of approaching things that, that is really the unlock. Like m I have a job where most things are going to happen anyways. I'm blessed with an awesome leadership team that is going to get stuff done. So like the VP job or even the partner job at Microsoft is a little bit like people trust you to figure out how you're going to provide value despite the right things happening anyways. And so it's about bar raising. It's about seeing the unknown it's about saying well we were going to go down this path but this one's even better and you can't do that without a little bit of um 
you know, collecting data by being in the arena and then, and then taking a step back. And I'd like to think people who on my team think that we, you know, we take that very seriously. We use, you know, Viva Pulse and Glint to measure it, you know, just from a mm -hmm. tech perspective, but then also spend an awful little time, you know, two or three of the all hands of the year is dedicated to either burnout or rest or um, talking about the value of that. Um, you know, I found, uh, I, maybe I just, you know, lucky that I experienced this, but as a teenager, uh, you know, I just read a lot, read extensively, but I, I would find when I would struggle on something, try to understand a concept, or if I was working in, you know, I had a, a statistics class that I was frustrated with, uh, when I was about 16 and, uh, you know, and I found that to go and unplug from that, just stop thinking about that. And I'm a, I'm a science fiction fantasy reader, you know, go and read something completely unrelated and I get like half a chapter and then realize and then suddenly my mind clearing up would be like, Oh, Hey, this is the answer that I was, that I was struggling with to this. I would come up with ideas for things doing something completely unrelated. Um, and it's like, this now it's like, I always have, you know, a science fiction book is my daughter was pushed me to go read this one, the Pierce Brown. Good one. Yeah, I, I think I read that before the last one was out. So I have not yeah. read series. I read the first couple. It was good. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, you know, again, I, 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 that's another reason why I keep like a notepad uh, around me because it's the times where I'm just like, oh, look, I'm going to unplug the brain from this uh, and listen to something, watch something, just do something unrelated. It frees it up, but it makes me think, hey, I need to go and I just had an idea for this, an article idea, or I need to something I think that will help this project or this client, you know, comes out of that. You know, yeah, I mean, you call it, it detox many... of, of the mind, you know? Yeah, yeah. I work that way too. I'm, I try to, I, not everybody does too. There's many different ways, very, you know, very um, different paths to success and thinking and creativity. And so uh, certainly the product maker try to recognize that there are many different ways of that. Um coming to life and um you know you and i live in very special times we were probably one of the point first point one percent of people in the world to use the internet uh if you just do the math of the number of people using the internet today and when you well, we used it first couple million right like yeah. AOL, blah, blah, blah. and so like wow what a privilege what a gift um uh and so we're more predisposed to seeing the advantages of information doubling every two years <laughs> yeah and our lives have actually been centered around that privilege we were given to be such early preview of what now the world is, has adopted. Um, certainly I built my work life around it, um, found satisfaction in many areas of life on it, but also realized that, you know, that's not the journey that everybody has with technology. Many people's journey with technology is it's much less rosy, um, much less all positive, much less on the bandwagon of being the early adopter, you know, loving drinking from the fire hose. And so, you know, I, th and I think a lot about that as a product maker. And one of the reasons I love Microsoft is I think fundamentally getting back to Microsoft runs on trust. We, we see that even more so than other places in tech and the responsibility we have to recognize that there's gosh, just so many emotions and thoughts on uh, people's relationship with technology and how we, how we make as many of those folks achieve more. It's sort of a, I think it's a pretty cool mission. Do you think is uh, is there danger in us becoming you know interpersonally uh, more disconnected because of AI? Is that is that again is that a topic that your team, the leadership team, talks about? It's like we could do a lot of cool things and automate a lot of things. Do you talk about hey, is this the right? Is are we disconnecting people too much from the those interpersonal connections? Yeah, I mean, you know, like I said, we. Um... I think we take learning together uh, with the world, how AI will impact it very seriously. And it's not something we're going to do in a dark box. It's something we're going to, you know, work together. I think we were, as you saw, we were incredibly disciplined and intentional as we introduced Copilot to the world last year to say it sits alongside you and it inspires your creativity. I, my, Microsoft, which is not known sometimes in all cases of the best product naming copilot was a, a huge success and i like it's a perfect branding for this for what you're doing with ai that it is a copilot not the pilot yeah no absolutely and i think people thought incredibly carefully about that learning from all of our history 
um, including how how we onboarded the cloud. And I'm pretty good friends with the chief AI ethicist at Microsoft. She's a neighbor of mine, and so you know, I and I know um, there's just a lot of people thinking about this, not just from a naming, but from a, what it means um, to all the stakeholders in the world perspective. And so I think we take that role very seriously. And I think you, you know. Microsoft got to that moment because of Satya's growth mindset, because of things we put in place before, because of, frankly, a business model that was a little bit less about, um, that had a lot of alignment between our customers and ourselves, which I don't think could be said for everybody in the tech industry. And even before AI came along, I think that allowed us to take a pole position and how to think about these problems very holistically. A lot of credit to Brad Smith at this company for always being in the lead and thinking about thinking about that. His book, Tools and Weapons, is a great read. Um and uh, he's just across the valley from me now here. <laughs> great. Um, but more to the point, like, I think that it wasn't, uh, I don't think we could have had that level of, um, you know, frankly, awareness of how to introduce this technology had it not been years of prep work to sort of take similar tough, tough technology and societal problems, wrestle with them, see what you know, we're not telling everybody what to do and we're not a replacement for various other stakeholders in the system at all, but we want to have a positive, productive uh, relationship there and, you know, and, and applying that to AI and, um, you know, and and we will see, like, certainly we're very excited about AI and sort of the whole industry is, is um, seeing how it all evolves from it sits alongside you and helps you be better was well, definitely a good statement of what the technology can do today. And it was definitely the right way to introduce the technology to the world. Um, I think to realize its full potential, we'll have to figure out language and evolve a little bit as it can take actions, as it can save time, as it can automate full processes, as it, as we started this, this uh, podcast, as it brings disparate systems even more together. Um, you know, it'll be really fascinating to co co develop, co explore of how it, um, is maybe a little bit less of only a personal co-pilot and something that is more influential um, uh, or more impactful, I guess. And how we do that with with a good understanding of how we're describing what it can do. I think it's a really fascinating problem. And um, uh, like I said, it goes all back to like working as much in the open as we can, reporting the, what we're seeing and then trying to be very intentional about how we introduce what we're doing to the world in a stepwise fashion. Well, well, Adam, I really appreciate your time. I, one thing I, I would suggest, maybe we, maybe we, we almost make this an annual thing. Maybe let's like, let's talk again and I'll, I'll, I'll see uh, other events later in the year, but, but really like early next year, uh, maybe we would do it in person during MVP summit or something or other, but uh, where we go and we look at some of the, again, I, I'm fascinated by the whole digital transformation and the cultural impacts of what we're going through, what we're, what we're sharing and what we're learning about this and reflect on that. And again, we could talk about the technologies and the specific examples of solutions out there, but I'm, it's just fascinating to look at and say, what, what do we think has changed? We, we could even go back and look at these episodes and, yeah, you know, of the years and, and say, you know, what, what do we think? And, not that what we do. I do a predictions tweet jam at the end of every year. Yeah. And some I've asked every year, somebody says, well, what did we say last year? <laughs> and I'm starting to go through and going back and calling people out on you said you thought this, what do you think now? It's, it's fascinating to look at that baseline, use that as a reference for how much change has happened, how much, how many of those incremental changes have really added up and impacted our lives. Yeah, so. I'd love to do that. Although I don't think it's about being right, Christian. Like, there's a oh, great no, I, I know it's 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 not. It's fun to go back and look at how different because we all know. Like, like if I, I look, if I think that my my car is going to be working, this is a dozen things that are going to happen over the course of the year. You know, in, yeah, in yeah, yeah. My car's running. So, oh, there's just this great book imaginable that I really love. The framing. It's about how to predict the future. Actually, how to talk about the future and then gets the great length of saying it's not about predicting something right like our, our goal is to build a future we want to see so it's not actually about saying i think it's going to be this way it's like i think by describing this potential future we can create it together and right. it's so i'm less about whether i'm trying to be right and more about like you know i have a dream come with me type of thing so yeah I, uh, when my I'd love kids, to do it. let's do it every yeah, year we should do it i just made me think i i when my kids were smaller uh, I, I had this, uh, I would tell them, I said, I know the answer to every important question. 
And then they would, uh, you know, obviously they then raise a question I didn't know the answer to. And my response was, that's not an important question. Uh, <laughs> I'm reading Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy to my 10 year old. So we're, we're about uh, to get to the most important question in the universe. There you go. Well, we know the answer. So yeah, we excited, do. You know. <laughs> well, Adam, really appreciate your time and uh, look forward to seeing you at the, I'm, I'm going to see you like a dozen times this year, but uh, we'll see you at the next event. Yeah, sounds good. Take care. You've been listening to the Collab Talk podcast. New episodes are published weekly, and you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and most other podcast platforms. Thanks for listening.